All right, we're going to start today's video talking about momentum. And we want to give a clear and simple definition of what momentum is. And momentum is inertia in motion. And the way we're going to define it with an equation is that momentum equals mass times velocity. And we use a P for the variable for momentum because Newton determined momentum to be purposeful motion. So we'll just use a P for that, uh, that definition. Um, and since it's inertia in motion, inertia is mass and motion is moving, so we have a moving mass. And so we're going to define it as an momentum is basically inertia in motion or a moving mass. They are not the same thing. Inertia and momentum are not the same thing, but momentum is that particular mass in motion. And the units for momentum are kilogram meters per second. The mass has a unit of kilograms, and the velocity has a unit of meters per second. So now what I'd like to do is talk to you about Newton's first and second laws. And the reason we want to do that is because Newton's first and second laws of motion uh, talk about what forces do to single objects. Newton's third law is talking about a pair of objects, so therefore a system of objects. Um, but Newton's first and second law are talking about what a force can do to an individual or single object. So Newton's first law, an object in motion, will remain in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. Now what we said about Newton's first law of in it for motion, and that's why it's in red there, is that we talked about it in terms of constant velocity or an object at rest. So its motion could be described as those two things. And then Newton's second law is F equals MA. And I want to say something in general about these two, is that forces change the motion of an object. So in order to get an object moving that was at rest or an object uh, to change direction that was traveling in a straight line at constant velocity, we have to apply force to change that motion. And uh, when Newton was talking about uh, forces and motion, he was talking about them in terms of momentum. For Newton, motion was momentum, meaning that some mass was moving at some velocity. So basically, forces change the momentum of an object. So if forces change the motion of an object, he talked of it in terms of momentum instead of the word motion. So forces change the motion of an object. So every time you see the word motion in Newton's first law, you need to think of the word momentum in that place. An object in momentum will remain in momentum unless acted upon by an outside force. In other words, it will keep its momentum unless you decide to change it. So now let's look at it in terms of Newton's second law. So as a note, we have net force equals mass times acceleration. So what it, Newton's second law is saying is that applying a force to an object will cause that object to accelerate. And since Newton always talked about motion as purposeful motion, if we're going to cause it to accelerate, we're going to show how Newton's second law, a net force, can cause an object to change its momentum. So how we're going to do that is we're going to substitute in for acceleration the change in velocity over the change in time because acceleration equals the change in velocity over time. So we're going to substitute that in. And then we're going to recognize that change of velocity is basically V minus V naught, so final minus initial over the time. We're then going to distribute the mass to the top of our fraction there and we're going to have m final minus m, uh, I'm sorry, mass times velocity final 
minus mass times velocity initial divided by time. And knowing that momentum is mass times velocity, we can substitute final momentum, or just P, minus initial momentum, which in this case would be P naught, and divide it by time. So the net force equals final momentum minus initial momentum, which can be defined as the change in momentum over time. And so we have now basically proving that, or have proven that applying a net force will change the momentum of an object. Now we're going to take this a step further. What we're going to do is we're going to solve this for the change in momentum. So we're going to end up multiplying both sides by change in time, and we're going to get the, a net force multiplied by time will equal the change in momentum. And the reason we do that is because force times time is another variable that we need to know, and it's called impulse. And the impulse, for some reason, is represented by a J. So we can, we can justify why momentum is a P because it stands for purposeful motion, um, an object that has mass moving with some velocity, but for we just impulse is J. We'll just say it's for some reason that they wrote in Latin a long time ago and we don't fully understand why it's a J at the moment. So now technically we have another equation that impulse equals the change in momentum or J equals the change in P and J equals net force times time or force times time. Now in a general summary of what's going on here, we're going to write down that a non-zero net force changes the motion of an object or, or a system of objects. Uh, we're not going to jump right into a system of objects right now, but uh, mostly because it's easier to deal with individual objects and then move forward to the system of objects. But a non-zero net external force, so an outside force, not internal force, changes the momentum of an object or of a system of objects. And we'll cover that a little bit later. So now let's go into impulse and the change in momentum. So the way to just attack impulse and change momentum is to look at an example. So what we're going to have is a wall, and we're going to take a mass, or a ball, with a mass of one kilogram, and we're going to throw it at 10 meters per second at the wall. When it hits the wall, it's going to have a velocity of zero and stick to the wall. So the ball is going to stay right on the wall, it's going to stick uh, because it's glued, or it's a very sticky substance, or whatever the case may be, but our ball is going to be thrown with 10 meters per second, and then it's going to hit the wall and stick. We'll call this side the initial, and this side the final. So what we have is one object. So the object is a mass of one kilogram. When it hit the wall, it didn't lose any mass, so it's still one kilogram. And it has two different velocities during this time frame. So what we're going to do first is find the change in momentum of the ball. And since the object has mass and it has two different velocities, what we do is we say the change in momentum equals the final momentum minus the initial momentum. And then we write that as mass times velocity, so the final velocity, which in this case would be zero, minus the mass times the initial velocity. So that is one kilogram times zero minus one kilogram times ten and we're going to get a change in momentum that equals negative 10 kilogram meters per second. Recognize the units. So in this case, the ball lost momentum. So now we're going to look at it a little bit differently. So we found the change in momentum. Let's say that the when the ball hit the wall, the collision took 0.5 seconds. We want to know what the average force of the, wall, the ball hitting the wall was. So if it took 0.5 seconds to collide with it, what is the average force? Well, we should know that impulse equals change in momentum. 
and we should know that impulse also equals force times time. So we're going to combine those two equations together into one where change of momentum equals force times time. We know that our change of momentum was negative 10 kilogram meters per second. We don't know the force, but we know the time was 0.5 seconds. So to solve for the force, we will divide by 0.5 on both sides. And we will get that the force was negative 20 kilogram meters per second squared. Negative 20 kilogram meters per second squared. Now, we have covered this, but it's been a while, and I'm noticing we're having problems with putting units next to our numbers. So we need to start figuring out what units are and know them. So when you see kilogram meters per second squared, that is a mass, kilograms, and meters per second squared is acceleration. So basically a mass times acceleration, and if you look up here at the top of the screen where we have net force equals mass times acceleration, a force is in the unit of newtons. So this is negative 20 newtons, a kilogram multiplied by a meter per second squared is a newton. Now momentum is a kilogram multiplied by a meter per second. So mass times velocity, not the same thing. And so we leave it as is, and then we memorialize Isaac Newton with kilogram meters per second squared and giving it the name of Newton. Anyway, that was a long explanation for what a unit is. But we have tw negative 20 newtons equals force. Now this force is, is opposite of the velocity. So we had thrown it at 10 meters per second, and then it hits the wall. This force is stopping the object, so the force is in the opposite direction of the velocity. So um, for next class, we need to think about how we would extend this a little bit further. So what we're talking about, what would happen if we extended the time, if the time took longer? Instead of 0.5 seconds, it took 2 seconds. What would that do to the average force during that collision time? So how would extending the time of the collision change the average force? And you just start thinking about that so that way you can come to class prepared and we can, you know, attack problems in that way. So now let's move on to another example. We have uh, the same ball with a velocity of 10 meters per second and 1 kilogram. And then it's going to hit the wall and bounce back at 5 meters per second. Same mass. It hasn't changed any mass. So again, we have it changing momentum where it's final momentum minus the initial momentum. So mass times final velocity minus mass times initial velocity, so 1 kilogram times 5 meters per second, and 1 kilogram times 10 meters per second. Now, a lot of people think we're good at this moment. I'm going to say no. We need to look at this and, and look over here and notice that we have velocity to the right and a velocity to the left. So the velocities are in different directions. That's important. Because when they are in different directions, one of them is going to have to be negative. So if we choose right to be positive and left to be negative, the 5 meters per second will have to have a negative placed upon it. So then we'll do 1 times negative 5 minus 1 times 10, and we'll get negative 15 kilogram meters per second as our change in momentum. Now you should look at this and notice that bouncing off the wall caused a greater change in momentum. We have a greater change. What this should really tell me is that momentum is a vector quantity. Velocity is a vector quantity, and therefore momentum is a vector quantity, which means that direction matters. So whenever you are given velocities, and it says they're in different directions, but the problem may leave them both positive, it is your responsibility to recognize which one needs to be negative and apply it in the equation. If you don't, you could miss some problems. So make sure we you know, have the wherewithal to read and recognize when things are in different directions and, different di and direction matters for a vector. Uh, so we'll practice some in class on this stuff.